our games of the week in college football. We've got three games of the week in college football to talk about. Uh, there are other big games. If you want to find out more about Oklahoma and Texas, check out the Playbook Experts YouTube channel. Uh, that's the show we have Mark Lawrence, Andy Isco, Tony Mejia, Jim Feist, and Victor King. And they break down the game. They give their picks and, and their, their analysis. So check that out at Playbook Experts. Uh, and we'll have a link in the description for that, of course. You also have Iowa State at West Virginia is a big game. Ohio State at Oregon, Ole Miss at LSU. So you got some other really big games. We're not going to talk about those games, but we do have three that we will. Um, and let's get right to it. We're going to start, first of all, we're going to go in alphabetical order, starting with Arizona. We'll stay out west. Why not? We're going to go with Arizona at BYU as the first game to talk about here. And BYU has just done a tremendous job this year. Who would have thought that BYU would be in this position? They're 5-0. and They've covered all, they've covered all four of their games in the FBS uh, they're three and a half point favorite here, and they have just been feasting lately on turnovers. If you take a look at the game that they won against Kansas State, Kansas State's winning the game six to three with about two minutes to go in 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 the half. Turnover, actually fumble, touchdown returned. Next play or two, turnover. Play or two later, touchdown. And all of a sudden, it's 17-6 BYU going into the second half, and it was all BYU in the second half, and that went against Kansas State. And BYU also did the same thing in some of their other previous wins, so including the Baylor game. So they've been feasting on really critical turnovers. That's good. I mean, it's telling you the defense has been strong because they don't have a high-powered uh, passing attack. They don't have a high-powered rushing attack. The good news is that their number one rusher last year, L.J. Martin, looks like he is going to return in this game. So keep an eye on that. And that's, good, of course, going to be important. But I'm taking Arizona in this one. I just think the time is 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 going to run out eventually for BYU. They just they're not that good. They're they're definitely good. They're probably going to wind up with nine wins this year. Uh, maybe they'll end up in a nice ball. But I just I don't see a real I don't see a team that's really that good. So because of that, I think a perfect opponent to knock them off would be a team that a lot of people realize has an awful lot of talent at quarterback. They got probably the best wide receiver in the game. Uh, by the way, here's a, a trend that goes against BYU. They're three and eleven in their last fourteen games following a bye against this. Well, rest makes rust for some teams, and apparently that's the way it is for Brigham Young. And I'm a little bit surprised at this football game. Uh, I really thought this game was going to be more in the pick range, uh, based upon the talent of these two football programs. You brought out an excellent point about BYU taking advantage and feasting on turnovers going their way. Uh, when I'm when I'm Handicapping games, the first thing I'm doing on Sunday morning is I'm hand logging the stats of every college football team. And I hand log them because I can remember or retain what it is I'm marking down as opposed to looking at a printout. And as you mentioned about BYU here, they're, they're advantageously to the plus in turnovers. But what lacks in situations like that is where are the meat and the potatoes? Where are the stats? The stats don't match the scores for their football games, and it's largely because of the gifts that they received. Sooner or later, that stuff ends up biting you, and when it bites you, it's almost always against a good quality team like Arizona, who's coming in a little bit hungrier than this 5-0 and fat cat BYU team is here in this football game here. I like Arizona in the upset here. And speaking of fat cats, uh, that is definitely one of the top trends that you have available on the uh, weekly newsletter. Because I remember hearing about it every year at this time, 5-0 and yep. Fat Cats. Uh, and so there were several games that you'll see this week with those uh, teams in mind. Iowa State's one of them. They're 5-0. and uh, Ohio State's another one. I believe Oregon and Ohio State. That's that's a combined five and zero. But Oregon is in the, in the is in the, the the really good position of being a five and zero uh, five and zero team. That's a dog. So uh, so there's a lot of that. I don't know how many games there are this week, but there's about three or four, right? A five and zero. There's maybe five games that are five and zero fat okay. cats. Yes, because uh, one know, of them is the well, game we're going to talk about in a minute with Penn State. Yes, exactly right. They're, they're one themselves, exactly. But I love to fade these 5-0 and oh fat cats, especially uh, when they think they're good. They look at the mirror all the time. Uh, they like too much of themselves. They read too many press clippings. And what do you know, lo and behold, next week they're 5-1. and one. So, And I think that could be the case here for BYU. Now, again, you're going to have you know three or four teams, maybe even a little bit more, that will end up 6-0, and 7-0, oh, 8-0. Oh, yeah. But those are the those usually are the special teams. Those are the teams that go far, 
or maybe one team that just, hey, we're having a special season. So what happens? It's not a 100% kind of a trend or anything like that, but it is a trend that does uh, have a great deal of, um, uh, I guess uh, the, the point is, is that statistically speaking, it's very high to go against the 5-0 and favorite, and it's also very high to go with the 5-0 and dog. Exactly right. Uh, the 5-0 and dog is a, a disrespected dog. He's getting no love, a Rodney Dangerfield dog, if you will. He wonders, what do we do to be cast in this role of underdog? So, you know, there's two ways to play these things, on as a dog and against as a favorite. Well, before we get to the Penn State game, we have another one. This is going to be late night, also out west, Big 12 once again, Kansas State at Colorado. And you know, I think it's great for the sport to see Colorado playing so well, off to a four and one start, had the Hail Mary win against Baylor, shocked everybody with the win over Central Florida. I mean, everybody expected Central Florida's rushing attack to rush all over Colorado, and that just didn't happen. Colorado, I mean, Shadour Sanders was off to a slow start. Now all of a sudden he looks back like the prospect everybody thought he was gonna be when the season began. Everybody's looking also at the kid, Travis Hunter. Uh, he is the number two. He is the number two Heisman, top Heisman uh, candidate in the country right now. Uh, right behind Genty, the running back from Boise State, and just ahead of Cam Ward, the quarterback of Miami. So that shows you where Colorado is right now. They're a home dog at three and a half with Kansas State. Both teams are four and one. Check this out. Kansas State is one and 11 against the spread. In the last 12, as the favorite of four or less off a straight-up ATS win. Of course, they had the blowout win against Oklahoma State a couple of weeks ago. And Colorado is 6-1 and one against the spread with rest. So a couple of trends telling me to take Colorado. I'm I, This is a tough one, but, you know, I'm actually starting to feel that maybe Colorado just has something going on this year. And we said this in the beginning of the year with Kansas State. We both respect Kleiman. We both respect the program and everything that he's done there. But we also talked about this is just not the same Kansas State team this year. They're a good team, and they've got a very exciting quarterback. But there's just, I just don't think they're a Big 12 championship type team. That's why neither one of us put them in the Big 12 championship game in our preseason predictions. But, hey, once again, as usual, Chris Kleinman has them off to a great start. Well, it's always, you know, just a very, very good coach. Uh, you know, look at the other side of this field here. You're looking at Deion Sanders. And you have to ask yourself, how good of a coach is Dion? I mean, he's a rah-rah recruiter, uh, rally the troops up kind of a coach. But I don't know if he, the X's and the O's, I think he gets out coached more times than he doesn't. What's really benefited Colorado this year was the great job that he did in the offseason hitting the transfer portal. He brought in a ton of good quality football players here. And it's showing in the win-loss record on his ledger this year. So maybe this, what we're seeing from Colorado this year isn't so much a fluke as it is the job that Dion did in the offseason to kind of fortify this football team. But I'm still a big Chris Kleiman fan, and I think this game is more like in the win range for Chris Kleiman here, and I don't think he's going to let this opportunity go. Uh, I was doing a couple of other shows, uh, call-in shows uh, today, and almost it's unbelievable the call-ins that people are wanting to know about Colorado, 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 Colorado. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't know if it's a Deion Sanders fan club all around the country or what it is, but uh, you know he's catching a lot of love right now, and maybe a little bit too much, and maybe sometimes it shows in the price. Give yeah. me Kansas State in this football game. Yeah, if they're for real, then uh, look. Uh, you can say what you want about the depth of the team, about their line of scrimmage, overall talent. But the fact is they've got a very talented quarterback and they've got, you know, a Deion Sanders type clone in, in Travis Hunter. And when you have two superstar players, sometimes uh, you can ride that for a while. We'll see if they can ride it again for one more weekend. All right. And then the last of the three games is another 5-0 and fat cat Penn State traveling to USC to take on the Trojans. This will be a 3.30 game, which means that I'll be doing the Penn State postgame show on the Penn State football YouTube channel probably somewhere around 7.30, 8 o'clock on Saturday night, so check that out. Penn State 10-1 and one against the spread as a road favorite in their last 11, including their only uh, game in that spot, week one in their win over West Virginia this year. Um, USC, meanwhile, 2-0, and oh, straight up against the spread as a home favorite this year, but they're taking on Penn State. You know, we just talked about in, in, on, on the other video, on the other uh, segment about uh, USC and Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago. And Wisconsin, a Big Ten team, going to USC, 
And the game with about three minutes to go in the third quarter was Wisconsin up by three. Matter of fact, they had a 10 point lead earlier mm-hmm. in the game, but then USC scored, I think three straight touchdowns and won the game. And uh, uh, it looked like a blowout, even though it wasn't a blowout really. So now comes Penn state to town. And this is a different story. Penn state is a, a major uh, ahead above Wisconsin, but still there's a couple of things to just be worried about. Penn State being 5-0, and uh, the go on the road at USC is a lot different than going on the road to West Virginia, no question about that, even though they've been really good in this spot, as I mentioned. They're 10-1 and one in the last 11 as a road favorite. Not many of those 11, though, have been at USC, not just the fact that USC has a quarterback and a, and a coach that can coach the offense, but like I had to remind one of the viewers who said to me, well, I don't know what you're talking about uh, USC's defense for, and I don't even know what he was saying that for because uh, I had to remind him, even though I'm sure he didn't see the video that a couple of weeks ago or when the season started, we talked about how highly uh, USC feels about their young defensive coordinator, Danton Lynn, DeAnthony Lynn's son. And that's why we feel USC is a much better, well-rounded team this year. They've got offense. They've got defense. But let's keep in mind, they've lost two of their last three. They lost to Michigan, a game they probably should have won. And they also lost a game against Minnesota that maybe they should have won. But uh, this is life in the Big Ten. Well, I think what we've gotten here, Greg, is another 5-0 and fat cat about to fall on its face. So if you're going to do the Penn State postgame show, ask Coach Franklin, what went wrong, Coach? Because I think that's going to be the question at the end of this football game here. Penn State's carrying a lot of uh, a lot of prestige here these days, and I just don't think that uh, they warrant what, what we're doing it right now. Very dangerous spot for them to go into Southern Cal, who's trailing Penn State in the conference and in the uh, in the polls. And you take a look at Lincoln Riley. What does Lincoln Riley do best? His teams overperform in the role of an underdog. He's not an underdog all that very often, but in the role that he's in this particular week, seven and one against the spread. I like him to pull the rug out on Penn State here. Another 5-0 and fat cat goes down on its face at Southern Cal. Yeah, I think if Penn State wins this game, then I am going to believe that this is going to be one of those – then maybe finally Franklin has his team because we know he's got his quarterback. I mean, this is the best quarterback he's probably had, uh, and he's had some good ones. Uh, by the way, Nick Singleton <clears throat> did not play in the previous game, nor should he have. Uh, so there's word that he probably plays in this game. And that's a big deal. They got a nice backup. Singleton's a big time running back. I think he's got 7.7 average per rush. So keep an eye on that. But yeah, I kind of agree. I kind of like USC in this spot. But uh, if Penn State is able to pull this one out, then I think we might actually be looking at James Franklin's best Penn State team and keep an eye on them, especially with Michigan being down this year. This could final, and, and it doesn't look like Iowa is going to do anything or Wisconsin. So, it, And if you beat USC, then that means it, it, it's Penn State, Oregon, and Ohio State. One of those teams is going to lose on Saturday. So if Penn State can win this game, they're going to be sitting there with the winner of the Ohio State-Oregon game as the top two teams in the Big Ten to keep an eye on the rest of the season. So. I think this game's got upset written all over it. I know this game's been beat up and hit pretty hard by the Sharps in Vegas. It opened up plus six. It's now down to plus three, three and a half oh. as we're speaking here right okay. now. So, uh, you know, they've responded real well in this particular role. But James Franklin, this is one of the roles that he really, really struggles in. And that's when he's on the road coming off a double digit win and he's facing a quality opponent 600 or better. He's 0 7 to the spread in that particular role. That's the role James Franklin wow. finds himself in on Saturday. Let's talk about upsets. Double-digit upsets, to be precise, here on our program. And we have four today. Uh, so far, we're five for 17, but that's a plus 210. Plus 210, uh, of course, these are double-digit upsets. So these are big numbers, usually three to one, between three to one and eight to one. And so depending on how many you take, if you, if you just get one of them a week, usually you're breaking even or sometimes actually making money, and that's what we're trying to do. So we're not trying to be 50 or – we're not trying to be 65%. Is that the number, Mark, for regular uh, wagers, that if you can be about 65%, you're doing really well? You're talking about on flat betting? Flat betting. 
on flat betting, you just need to win 53 and a half percent to break. Oh, that's even. all. Okay. Yeah, so 65, all. that would be like, that's you, you're not going to get better than that. That's, that's a really good handicapper. If he could do 65, he's one of the better, he's one of the better handicappers in the industry. Well, if let me tell you, put it this way, Greg, I've been in this business for 40 years. And if I had hit 65% of all my picks in my 40 years, <laughs> I'd be a partner of Elon Musk right now. Okay? <laughs> so 60, 55, 58. A good year, a good year in truth is 57%, 57, 58, 59 okay. is a real good year. And anything over 60 is a thank you, dear Lord. It was a really nice season. All right. Sounds good.